How are you all doing today? Woo! Woo! Excellent. I like that. So um, I know you're all here at the H2O AI conference, so you probably may already know how you feel about AI, but just to get a quick poll. When you think about AI today, how many of you get excited? Raise your hand. OK, pretty much everyone. Anyone not so sure? OK, anyone just feel like bad when you hear AI? OK, so we have an overly positive room. That's great. So artificial intelligence has been called many things, including the, fourth in the driver of the fourth industrial revolution and the new electricity. It's going to drive a tremendous amount of economic growth, adding close to $30 trillion to global GDP by 2030, and it's getting embedded into our daily lives. A recent Gallup poll showed that 80% of people use AI technology every single day. What I'm really excited about with AI is its potential to be applied towards solving some of the world's most pressing challenges today. A recent Microsoft report showed that artificial intelligence can help us with issues like water quality, water shortages, um, monitoring the health of farms in real time, addressing climate change, monitoring biodiversity, and many other exciting applications. I get to see this amazing potential for AI to do good every single day at the work I do with AI for All. AI for All is a nonprofit organization that's working to foster the next generation of diverse leaders in AI. And I'm super excited to have some of those leaders here today. Will you raise your hand if you're from AI for All? Woohoo! And my team is back there. Excellent. Super excited to have some of the community here. So no one could have said it better than one of our graduates about the positive potential for AI. You don't have to be an AI expert to know that we, in this day and age, are in the middle of something almost magical, infinitely creative, and beautifully applicable in a variety of settings. So I want to share the story of three AI for All alumni who are already doing amazing things in the field, and they're just in high school. So the first is Stephanie. Stephanie grew up as the daughter of farm workers in Salinas, California, first generation Mexican American. She went through our AI for All summer camp and she really found her passion in the field. And after the program, she went on to address water quality issues using AI technology, something that's directly affected her and her family growing up. Meet Amy. Amy also got really passionate about AI and its connection into the healthcare field at our AI for All summer camp program. She went on to research how to improve surgeon technique and precision using AI technology. Her research won her best paper award at NIPS, now called NURIPS, one of the largest AI conferences. Raise your hand if you've heard of NIPS. Excellent. She was competing against hundreds of adults. Meet Becca. Becca was really passionate about, oops, let's go back to Becca. There we go. See Becca's beautiful face. Uh, so Becca was really passionate about social justice growing up, and when she learned about AI, she realized that she could combine her passion with social justice with AI technology. This past summer, Becca was a research intern at MIT studying AI in the criminal justice system. These are just three examples of young people, among many others that we see every day, that are making this positive future for AI possible. Unfortunately, there are many factors that are preventing more young people like Amy, Stephanie, and Becca from even getting into the field. There's a massive diversity crisis in the field today. It's currently being built by, the AI technology is currently being built by a homogenous group of individuals. And not everyone has access to getting involved or even hearing about AI technology. One of the impacts of the diversity crisis in AI has been leading to implicit biases in society getting embedded or amplified in AI technology systems. This includes race, gender, and other bias. So why does this matter? Why is this important? We're delegating life-changing decision-making to AI technology, deciding who gets access to a job, who gets access to a loan, who gets access to parole, and other life-changing decisions. And so when there's bias or other errors in the technology, the best case scenario is that it creates you know, uh, products that don't match the customer needs or the user's needs. 
The worst case scenario is that it further marginalizes groups that are already being left out of certain uh, you know, services and opportunities in society and actually exacerbating existing equity issues in the economy that we're working so hard to solve right now. Just to put some numbers to it, so recent reports showed that the AI field overall on a global level is only 12% female. Of those currently looking for AI jobs, 71% of applicants are male. And for those actually teaching AI at a university level, 80% 80 are male. There are many examples of bias that we see cropping up, and I'm just going to share one of these with you today which is a study that came out last year called Gender Shades. Raise your hand if anyone has heard of the Gender Shades study. Okay, a few of you here and there. So this came out by Joy Bulamwini, Timnit Gebru out of MIT Media Lab and Microsoft Research. And it looked at the top facial recognition systems that are being used today. And it looked at how accurate they are in actually recognizing someone's face. If you look at overall accuracy, it's pretty good, upwards of 90 nine plus percent. But then if you start to break it down by race and gender, a very different story emerges. It's much less accurate for people of color and especially women of color. This has enormous implications as this technology is now getting incorporated into immigration services, hiring, law enforcement, airports, and so many other systems that are making these important decisions. There are so many examples of bias cropping up that I could spend the entire uh, session just on that and wouldn't be able to go through all the examples. So this is happening and it's real and it's a huge, huge problem. So what do we do about it? The good news is that there's actually a lot of tangible steps that we can take to address this and we see many companies doing. The first is, <laughs> hello, testing, monitoring, and auditing. And so we're seeing companies start to implement some of these internal protocols to test for things like bias, um, we also see bias mitigation tools that are actually being developed um, for engineers and developers to use. The second is around standards. So we see that a lot of companies who are building AI systems are actually developing internal ethics and fairness standards to really help and arm developers, designers, and technologists who are building this to understand what the best practices are and how to develop this responsibly and fairly. We also see other groups coming together, um, interdisciplinary groups, like the Partnership on AI. Have any of you heard of the Partnership on AI? Definitely check them out. There's also the IEEE AI and Ethics Initiative. So they've developed something called Ethically Aligned Design, which is a pa paper that's available online for free that you can check out. Again, it's called Ethically Aligned Design. And this is a long, uh, very well-researched list of best practices around developing AI ethically and safely. This is really exciting to see, and we definitely need to have these best practices and industry standards. My question is really around how we ensure that people are incentivized to use these standards and adopt these standards, and asking the question of who's held accountable if these standards are not actually abided by. So a lot of big questions still to be answered, but it's great to see there's movement in this area. The next is around, of course, transparency and explainability, making sure that we can understand how these systems are making decisions, because only then can we actually address any issues with them or understand where bias is coming from. We're also seeing the conversation happen around regulation and what role government has to play in ensuring safe and responsible AI. And we see certain countries uh, moving forward more quickly than, than others in this area, but a lot of it is still very experimental and slow moving. So all of these pieces are so critical, and we must do them and more to be able to mitigate risks like bias and other ethical issues. However, I believe that most importantly, we have to focus on diversity and inclusion, especially at these early stages of AI technology. This is why we started AI for All. Our mission is to increase diversity and inclusion in artificial intelligence, not just in development, but also in research, policy, and education. And having diverse viewpoints in all the ways that AI is going to be touching society. We have three uh, core initiatives along this mission. The first is an AI summer camp that's focused on underrepresented high school students, introducing them to AI technology in an inclusive 
and welcoming environment, and having them work on AI research projects related to solving important problems in the world today using AI technology. We host these summer camps at some of the top AI research universities across the, the North America, and I'm excited to say that last summer we had six. This year we're going to have 10 um, locations for the summer camps so, uh, serving over 300 students. So the camp really sparks this idea that artificial intelligence is for them and that they can uh, get, become part of it and succeed in it. But that's not where we stop because it's really important to have the continued support in the long term. That's where change makers in AI comes in. And we actually have our manager of change makers in AI program right over there, Valerie. So excited. Uh, if you're interested in talking to her, she's right over there and we'll be outside afterwards. So this is really about supporting the long-term trajectory of our young people into the AI field with long-term continuing education opportunities, internships, fellowships, mentorship, and all the things that we know are needed to be successful in the field. If any of you are interested in getting involved with this program or you have a need for very talented interns or fellows, please let us know. One of the other programs that we're really, really excited to be launching this year is called the Open Learning Program. So this is really building on our learnings and the data that we have from the summer camp program and making our curriculum available for free globally to a worldwide audience. We're going to serve a million students in five years across the globe, providing basic free AI education that helps people get introductory uh, experience and technical expertise, and then work on projects to solve problems that they care about in their community. So this is launching in April, and we're really, really excited to be able to scale what we've seen works in our summer camp program. We've seen really amazing results from our program so far. We see that most of our students want to go into the AI field after they graduate, which is amazing. We also see that most have started AI research projects or outreach projects. They start AI clubs at their schools or they develop projects to solve problems in their communities. We also see that 100%, all of them, feel like this technology can be a force for good in the world and in their communities. We see tremendous impacts around confidence and around feeling like they're part of a community and with peers and mentors. One of the things that we have learned and we see every single day is that bringing diversity and inclusion into the field is not just important to mitigate risks like bias and other ethical issues. It's also critical to bring in more innovative solutions, to having a more diverse set of problems even being addressed with technology in the first place. And lastly, to create more equally distributed economic opportunity. There's a lot of research that proves this, just to share a couple of data points. A recent Intel sh study showed that if we increase diversity in the tech sector alone, it will add $500 billion in new value to the economy every year. A recent study by Stanford economist Raj, Raj Chetty showed that if we include women, minorities, and low-income people in the innovation economy, the rate of innovation in America could quadruple. So there's huge and tremendous economic and societal benefits from diversity and inclusion. And it's not just about mitigating risks. So we know that it's critical for AI technology to live up to its full potential and to mitigate some of these risks, but how do we actually do this? I want to talk about three key areas to focus on around diversity and inclusion. The first is self-awareness. So before we take any action, really taking a deep look at ourselves a hard look in the mirror, an honest look in the mirror about where are our biases. They might be implicit biases. Where are those showing up in maybe our life or our business practices? And there's a lot of great literature out there, classes, workshops, courses to educate ourselves around these issues. And this is critical to start with before we start trying to fix it um, because it really starts with us and starts with our level of self-awareness and commitment. The second is around education. Only 40% of schools in the US teach computer science. That means most young people are getting left out from even knowing that these opportunities exist and getting the opportunity to build these skills from an early age, which we know is critical. So starting 
introducing these concepts early in high school and even earlier in middle school is critical. There's also hiring, so making sure that we're not overlooking diverse sources of talent that are out there, and we're actually making sure that our hiring practices doesn't have any form of bias or discrimination that we're not aware of. So there's so much amazing diverse talent out there, I just wanna give a shout out to a couple of groups that you could hire from today. Latinx in AI, Black in AI, Women in Machine Learning, AI for All, when our students are growing up, getting into the workforce, and of course, internships, and then fast.ai. These are just some of the many groups out there that have amazing talent for you to tap into today as you're building your AI teams. Lastly, and most importantly, is around retention and advancement. We can't just track whether we're hiring diverse teams. We have to track whether they're staying. Companies lose $18 billion a year in the tech sector from people leaving due to discrimination and harassment. That is embarrassing and it's preventable. We can ensure that we have inclusive cultures that are supportive of diverse teams, that we have best practices around mentorship, advancement, and professional development. So diversity and inclusion is so critical for artificial intelligence, and we're so early on in the space that I really believe if we take action now and we're proactive and we implement some of these be best practices, we can solve this and we can address it before the train leaves the station and is moving too fast. So this is so critical, not just to mitigate some of the ethical risks that we talked about, but to maximize the potential benefit for AI so that more people like Stephanie, Amy, and Becca aren't left out of the AI field. Not only are they benefiting from the amazing opportunities in AI, but we benefit from their contributions and their unique genius in the field. So we don't wanna miss out on potential moonshots that they may develop in the future. I hope that we can all work together to ensure that AI can live up to its full potential. Thank you so much. I'd love to take questions. Excellent. Yes, so the first question is, how many students have gone through the program and are working in the AI field? Great question. So we so far have about 250 AI for All alumni that have gone through this AI summer camps. And I mentioned this summer that we will have uh, 300 new students. So by the end of the summer, we'll have 500 alumni. With the open learning program, we're hoping to reach over 8,000 students this, this year with that program. So because our students are in high school, currently the oldest class is a freshman in college, so they're still not in the workforce, but many of them have done research internships at Stanford, other types of companies, so they're definitely an amazing source of talent for interns and fellows if you need them. And we'll certainly let you all know when they graduate and are in the workforce and looking for jobs. Can you elaborate on how AI for All plans to carry out the mission of diversity and inclusion into informing policy making? That's a great question. So currently AI for All is not doing direct policy influencing work. We're focusing on the education side to really prepare our students from diverse backgrounds to get into policy and be voices in those conversations and be leaders in the space. We are part of many of the discussions around uh, working groups around AI and ethics uh, initiatives and creating standards to make sure that we're thinking about diversity and inclusion from the start. But right now, our focus is more on de developing leaders and developing uh, voices in the space to be able to influence policy in the future. The last, oh. Do you have any plans to use your platform to encourage underrepresented non-summer camp computer science college students into AI? I think if I'm understanding that question correctly, the open learning program that I mentioned is focused on underrepresented young people who haven't gone through our summer camp. And so we're focusing on communities and areas that are currently not part of developing AI or have access to these opportunities. These include places that aren't in cities, for example, or thinking about globally who is underrepresented in AI. And so that program, again, will be available for free for everyone in those areas. And then the last question, do I have time for one more? Yes. 
Do you have advice for orgs in similar space on how to enable and empower people to make a difference at an individual level? That's such a good question. So one of the things that we've found really works well in our programs is helping students really get hands-on experience using AI technology. A lot of people would say, wow, you're teaching high school students AI. Isn't that typically taught in master's programs or PhD programs? But the truth is we can get young people started in AI really, really quickly and within a couple of weeks as long as they have some basic skills. And so really giving them that hands-on exposure and ownership over the process of how to build things with AI is really, really empowering because they begin to recognize their own power and their own strengths and their own ability to apply this to solving problems that they care about. So that we found is really effective. It's also really important to connect young people with role models and mentors in, this, in the field who may have similar backgrounds to them. There's a quote that says, if you can see it, you can be it. And that's really, really powerful. And so the supportive community that students can have, whether it's peers, role models, and mentors, in addition to getting that hands-on experience, we've found to be really empowering in our curriculum. And I think I'm done with questions. So thank you so much, everybody. If you want to talk to us, come out those straight out those doors.